for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. And the last of the roofless was like a winter rainstorm, noise of aliens like heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the roofless was still. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a, rich, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Here endeth the lesson. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, 
Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. And 
he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning's Gospel lesson presents our last parable in Matthew's Gospel. Beyond this, there will be a few little parable-ish stories, but they're not called parables. And what a way for us to leave the parables this year. This is a tough one. And by that I don't mean the first part about the king and the slaves and the wedding guests. That part is fairly clear and easy to interpret. Like last week, this part of it is unmistakably allegory. And there isn't much interpretive veneer that needs removal. The king represents God. And since there is no separate reference to the son, this means the triune God. And the wedding feast is God's kingdom, the heavenly banquet. So those who were invited first are the leaders of Israel, and the first servants are the Old Testament prophets. The second invitation is the invitation of the apostles and the early Christian church, which is again rejected. There's even a reference here to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that line about the guests who were first invited, who abused and even killed the first two sets of servants, and so the king burned their city. That's actually one of the markers that's used to date Matthew's gospel to being sometime after 70 AD and the burning and destruction of Jerusalem. And then there is a third set of servants. That's the church militant, the church ongoing. And since the declaration of the gospel is still ongoing, thus the New Testament is still unfolding, that's us. We're the third set of servants. That's you and I. But then, of course, we have to be careful how far we stretch a parable. Remember, it's just meant to spark someone into active thought. It's not, if you stretch it too far, it doesn't make sense anymore. And I remind you of that because we're not just the third set of servants, but we are also the people from the main street, good and bad, who are invited in this final round to the wedding banquet. We answer the invitation, but then also become the ones who invite others. This is how the gospel advances. And that makes sense, and it's fairly straightforward. But then we have this chap who doesn't have the proper clothes for the wedding feast, who, when he is confronted, has nothing to say. And so he ends up cast into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. We have to figure out what we're to make of that. Recall that our scholar of the parables, our expert, is Joachim Jeremias, the 20th century German biblical scholar who is still today regarded as the authority on the parables. And remember that Jeremias truly felt that most of the parables are the words of Christ himself but that the interpretive embellishments are not. And so the first thing we have to do is remove those so that we can get at the original. And if you will recall, Jeremiah felt that all that weeping and gnashing of teeth stuff was a gloss that was added to certain parables by the Matthaean community when they wrote this gospel. And he felt the same way about that recurrent line Many are called, but few are chosen. So it behooves us to remove those. Jeremiah would say those were added sometime between when Christ actually said this and when the Methane community recorded them. The parallel here is in Luke, and Luke doesn't have either of those lines. 
And so what we're left with then is a man who would certainly have been welcome to join the feast, being as how the servants had been instructed to invite everyone, good or bad. So it cannot be that he's uninvited. It is simply that he is not garbed in a wedding robe. Now, over the centuries, this situation has resulted in some fairly strong interpretations of this portion of the parable. For centuries, it was assumed that there must be, have been special garments that were provided by the host for guests to wear, sort of like a fancy dress-up party. And for years, this was used to surmise that the passage is speaking of something the reformers called imputed righteousness. The garment, the wedding garment, represented the righteousness of God as the host who was giving it to his guests. And so thus it came to mean a righteousness which is imputed to us through Christ's atoning work so that we may join in the heavenly feast. If you answer the invitation to the wedding feast of the kingdom of God, then although you are unworthy of such a banquet because of your manifold sins, God through Christ has given you a clean robe to wear, such that what is seen, what matters, is not the mess you may be underneath it all, but that clean white robe. That is the only thing that is seen. This was often referred to as the raiment of Christ. And just like so many practical things that took on deeper liturgical meanings over the years, the very clothes that I am wearing today came to signify the wedding garments of the banquet feast of God's kingdom and the way we are imputed with the raiment of Christ. And to understand what I'm wearing and how such symbolism grew up around it, a little history lesson is needed. The black street garment that you often see me wearing and others, the cassock, wasn't something invented by the church. By the fifth century, this was what the Roman toga had become. But with the barbarian hordes invading Rome, these clothes fell out of fashion. It's funny how fickle people can be, no matter what the era is. The Romans were suffering under these barbarian invasions, and yet they adopted barbarian fashions because they thought it looked cool and dashing. The Roman citizenry ceased wearing the cassock and took on the pants, tunics, and belts that were favored by barbarian horse people. And the church then, as the church is now, was somewhat changed averse, which is probably an understatement. And so over the centuries, we retained this mode of dress. The reason for the color black was simply that was the cheapest dye color in early common era Rome. So imagine, if you will, the clergy have been out in the hot, dusty, filthy streets, and they come back to church for service. And bear in mind, they wear that black cassock summer and winter. And they come back to the church to put on the beautiful, expensive, and fragile chasubles, dalmatics, and tunics, and stoles. And so in order to keep these fineries clean, it became necessary to add a garment under them to protect the finer garments from the grime and sweat underneath. And thus, the alb and the amice were born. They are undergarments under the fine damask robes, but over the dirty cassock to keep the fine damask robes clean. And just the same when a priest wears only a stole, there is a shorter undergarment which goes under the stole called a surplice, which is there to keep the stole off of the dirty cassock. So there is the history of liturgical attire in a nutshell. But given the second half of the parable of the wedding feast, over time this took on a deeper liturgical meaning as, is illustrated, as it illustrated the parable. Cassock and surplus, or cassock and owl, were taken to say, what makes the parson clean enough to serve in the Holy of Holies? It's certainly not what he is on the inside. That's black and filthy. He thus requires the white overgarment of righteousness in order to serve God at the altar. 
That's the symbolism that grew up around it. And that was a fine way of viewing things until our knowledge of first century Semitic wedding customs caught up. Today we understand that the weddings with which Jesus would have been familiar, like the site of his first miracle in Cana, did not include some special garment handed out by the host. What was in mind, rather, was that the guest would go home, get cleaned up, and put on clean clothes. Essentially, it was then as it is now that a wedding banquet called for someone to put on their Sunday best. That's what's in mind here. And that subtle difference becomes less subtle when we start talking about righteousness. An important tenet of the Reformation is that we do nothing to earn righteousness. And that's fine and good, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. But that does not mean that there isn't any work involved in faith. With this subtle change, the feast itself represents righteousness. And it's a righteousness for which we must prepare ourselves in some ways. It's a righteousness that a life of faith prepares us for. And I bring it up this morning because we as a congregation have been facing our own banishment from this, our representation of the great banquet feast of the Lamb. But I am happy to tell you that this has shifted slightly. And there may be a light at the end of the tunnel, and that light may not be an oncoming train. The transition team has given permission for our vestry to ask the bishop for an extension of time. We have been given permission to ask the bishop to allow us to remain open until Epiphany, which is January 6, 2018. If by that time we can craft a long-range strategic plan by which we can achieve independent viability, one with provable benchmarks and timelines, then we may be able to remain in this church beyond Epiphany. I'm surprised I expected cheering. That's okay. It is a sermon after all. <laughs> this is good news. It is okay to clap in a high Anglican church. <laughs> and it is okay to laugh. This is good news. But it comes with quite a few ifs. And the biggest if I want you to consider this morning is if we are willing to do the work that is necessary. I know all of us feel worn down, tired, and ground down from the way this process has moved the last several weeks. But just like the one who neglected to go home and do the work of preparing for the feast, this means that each and every one of us must be, necess must be willing to do the necessary work. We can't rely on a few people, we can't stand aside and expect the vestry or some committee or your wardens or your clergy to carry this forward. All of us have to be willing to do the work, to prepare ourselves to be able to continue this our wedding banquet feast of the Lamb. No one can sit and wait for others to do it. Whoever can wash must wash, whoever can mend must mend, whoever can press must press. We've been given an invitation, an opening, and it behooves us to get busy preparing for it. Amen.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten as His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, and Eugene and Chilton, our bishops, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Donald, our president, Lawrence, our governor, and Catherine, our mayor that they may be led to wise decisions and right action for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and suffer those commended to our prayers and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Scott, Tom, Diane, Jill, Tim, Alistair, Susan, Anthony, Marvin, Jean, Kate, Ted, Kemp, Beth, Jean, Joseph, John, Greg, Sam, Edith, Jean, Gail, William Andrew, Heather, Dean, Michael, Charles, Joyce, 
Christopher, Kathleen, Jennifer, Monica, Chris, Gary, Carl, Sue, Julianne, Brian, Harry, Karen, Ellen, George, and those we name silently in our hearts. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in their faith and fear. Thy servants, our benefactors, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of Our Lady, blessed John, blessed Luke, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we only repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. If any sin we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion here, regardless of your denomination. 
uh, to do so, simply come up at the appointed time, one hand goes over the other like this, and the rest pretty much takes care of itself. You are welcome to receive in one kind or the other if you prefer. Simply indicate that to the server. And all are welcome at God's table, baptized or no. If you would like to come forward and receive a blessing, simply come forward with everyone else and put your arms across your chest like this, and I'll pronounce a blessing for you. We're so glad you're here, and you are certainly welcome at God's table. Uh, please also join us for the coffee hour and for the meeting to follow. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name for an offering to come to his courts.
Glory be to thee, O Lord our God, for that thou didst create heaven and earth, and didst make us in thine own image, and of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him, and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and in institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that, his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. For the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thy people do celebrate and make, with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make. Having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, 
and looking for his coming again with power and great glory. We most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and with thy word and Holy Spirit, to bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be unto us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, whereby we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies. Grant, we beseech thee, that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and also that we and all thy whole church may be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity